This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Algie Pug. Flowers of Free Thought by George William Foote. Section 8. Spurgeon and Hell. Charles Lamb was one of the best men that ever lived. He had his failings, but he never harmed anyone but himself. He was capable of astonishing generosity, and those acquainted with the inner tragedy of his life know that it was a long act of self-denial. He was also extremely modest, but not utterly devoid of indignation, and if he could not denounce bitterly, he could speed a shaft of satire into the breast of wickedness or cruelty. On one occasion, in the days of his youth, he was justly annoyed by his friend Coleridge, whose character was very inferior to his own, although he always assumed a tone of moral superiority. Lamb was so galled by Coleridge's air of virtue and piety, at a moment when the humorist was suffering terribly in consequence of his sister's calamity, that he sent the transcendental poet a list of stinging questions. One of them asked whether one of the seraphim could fall, and another whether a man might not be damned without knowing it. This last question suggests itself in the case of Mr. Spurgeon. Mrs. Spurgeon, Dr. Pearson, and other of the great preacher's friends are all assuring us that he is in glory. Writing seven days after his death, Mrs. Spurgeon said, He has now been a week in heaven. It is natural that she should think so, and we do not wish to rob her of any consolation, nor do we suppose that this article will ever come under her notice. But is it not just possible that Spurgeon has gone to hell? And why should not the question be raised? We mean no personal offence. We speak in the interest of justice and truth. Spurgeon was very glib in preaching about hell, and we do not know that he had a monopoly of that special line of business. He never blenched at the idea of millions of human beings writhing in everlasting torment. And why should it be blasphemy, or even incivility, to wonder if he himself has gone to perdition? Predestination, as the Church of England article says, is wonderfully comforting to the elect that is, to those who imagine themselves to be so. But what if they are mistaken? What if a man, yea, a fancied saint, may be damned without knowing it? God Almighty has not published lists of the elect. Many a Calvinistic Pharisee is perhaps a self-elected saint after all, and at the finish of his journey may find that he has been walking in the wrong direction. One of Spurgeon's rooted notions was that unbelievers were sure of hell. They bore the mark of predestinate damnation broad upon their foreheads. Now, at the bottom, this means that a man may be damned for believing wrongly. But how can anyone be sure that Spurgeon was absolutely right? The Baptists are only one division of Christians. There are scores of other divisions. All cannot be right and all may be wrong. Even if one is entirely right, how do we know it is the Baptists? According to the law of probabilities, Spurgeon was very likely in the wrong. And if wrong belief, however sincere, entails damnation, it is quite possible that at 11.05 p.m. on Sunday, January the 31st, Spurgeon entered hell instead of heaven. Footnote the next article will explain this matter. End footnote. Far be it from us to wish a fellow creature in hell, but there is always a certain pleasure in seeing the engineer hoist with his own petard. All tragedy has a touch of comedy. Fancy Spurgeon in Hades groaning, I sent other people here by the million, and here I am myself. How would this be worse than the groan of any other lost soul? Few men are devils or angels. Most are neither black nor white, but grey. Between the best and vilest, how much difference is there in the eye of infinite wisdom? And if God, the all-knowing and all-powerful, created
created men as they are, strong and weak, wise and foolish, good, bad and indifferent. There is no more injustice in Spurgeon's burning in hell than in the damnation of the worst wretch that ever cursed the world. Spurgeon used to preach hell with a certain gusto. Here is a hot and strong passage from his sermon on the resurrection of the dead. When thou diest, thy soul will be tormented alone. That will be a hell for it. But at the day of judgment, thy body will join thy soul, and then thou wilt have twin hells, thy soul sweating drops of blood, and thy body suffused with agony. In fire, exactly like that which we have on earth, thy body will lie, asbestos-like, for ever unconsumed. All thy veins, roads for the feet of pain to travel on, every nerve a string on which the devil shall for ever play his diabolical tune of hell's unutterable lament. After preaching this awful doctrine, a man should be ill for a fortnight. Would it not afflict a kind-hearted man unspeakably to think that millions of his fellow beings, or hundreds, or even one, would suffer such a terrible fate? Would it not impair his sleep and fill his dreams with terror? But it did not have this effect on Spurgeon. After preaching hell in that way, and rolling damnation over his tongue as a dainty morsel, he went home, dined with a good appetite, drank his wine, and smoked his cigar. There was not the slightest doubt in Spurgeon's mind as to the endless doom of the damned. Here is an extract from another sermon. Thou wilt look up there on the throne of God, and it shall be written, For ever, when the damned jingle the burning irons of their torment, they shall say, For ever, when they howl, echo cries, For ever. For ever is written on their racks, for ever on their chains, for ever burneth in the fire, for ever, ever reigns. How bodies are to burn without consuming, how a fire could last for ever, or how a good God could roast his own children in it, are questions that Spurgeon did not stop to answer. He took the damnable doctrine of damnation as he found it. He knew it was relished by myriads of callous, foolish people, and it gave such a pungent flavour to a long sermon. His listeners were not terrified. Oh dear, no! Smith, the Newington greengrocer, was not alarmed. He twirled his thumbs and said to himself, Spurgeon's in fine form this morning. Archdeacon Farrer protests against the notion of a fiery everlasting hell as the result of fear, superstition, ignorance, hate, and slavish letter-worship. He declares that he would resign all hope of immortality to save a single human soul from the hell of Mr. Spurgeon. But is not the hell of Mr. Spurgeon the hell of the New Testament? Does not Jesus speak of everlasting fire? Why seek to limit the duration of hell by some hocus-pocus of interpretation? It is idle to pretend that everlasting means something less than everlasting. If it means that in relation to hell, it must also mean it in relation to heaven. Dr. Farrer cannot have two different meanings for the same word in the same verse. And should he ever go to hell, he will pardon us the supposition, how much consolation would he derive from knowing that his doom was not everlasting, but only eternal? There was more honesty and straightforwardness in Mr. Spurgeon. He preached what the Bible taught him. He set forth a hateful creed in its true colours. His presentation of Christianity will continue to satisfy those who belong to the past, but it will drive many others out of the fold of faith into the broad pastures of free thought. End of section 8